Recording starting. Oh, uh, Isaac, you have to start recording. I don't have permission. Oops. <laughs> it should be recording. Okay. You can go ahead, Jen. Okay. I knew I knew the cat was going to come as soon as he knew that there was a Zoom call. He loves Zoom calls. Um, <laughs> hi, I'm Jennifer Ackerfield, and let me pull up my presentation here. Um, oh, hold on, sorry. Please let me hear. There it is. All right. Okay. Well, I just want to say it's so amazing to see everyone here today. Welcome and thank you all for joining our Tika Talks. Uh, I'm Jennifer. This is Turtle. Apparently, we're giving this talk together. Yes. <laughs> and I'm excited today to bring to you the story of the funky thistle. So. You know, we are all united here today um, by our shared passion and study for the family composite, one of the most speciose and evolutionarily successful families on earth, with an estimated one in every 10 species belonging to this family worldwide. And here in the Colorado Rocky Mountains, where I am, uh, about one in every eight species belong to the composite family. So with such a large and diverse family, there are many different lineages to study and of course, many questions to ask. For me, I am particularly passionate about this very prickly genus, the genus Circium or the thistles, a member of the Karjui tribe. Now as botanists, you know, we are part explorer, part naturalist, part detective, you know, just ever curious about the natural world around us. Together, we ask questions such as, what is a species? How did they get there? Why are some common and others rare? And what factors have influenced their diversification? Because documenting and ultimately preserving biodiversity relies on accurate taxonomic classification. We cannot protect what we don't know is there. And so with that, I bring to you the next best-selling Nancy Drew novel, The Mystery of the Mountaintop Thistle. So Circium scopulorum, or mountaintop thistle, is found in the Alpine throughout the Southern Rocky Mountains. So uh, here that ranges in elevation from 11,000 to about 14,000 feet. Uh, and believe me, it is not the easiest <laughs> plant to study. Just because you see a dot on a map doesn't mean that that location is easily accessible. Mountaintop thistle, you know, it's just really been a, a subject of intrigue for me for a very long time. For uh, nearly 30 years now, I have been hiking to the tops of mountains throughout Colorado. And during this time, I've been observing, documenting, and ultimately just wondering if all of these mountaintop thistles are indeed a single species but really lacking sufficient lines of evidence to support my hypothesis that they are not. And so after a 15 year hiatus from formal research, I fortunately was finally able to return to graduate school and begin to answer this question. Are all of these mountaintop thistles indeed a single species? And it was during this time that I serendipitously and fortuitously met the amazing Dr. Vicki Funk, senior curator of Composity at the Smithsonian Institution, who not only took me under her wing, but introduced me to so many of you here today. Now, mountaintop thistle is a dramatic and cons conspicuous component of the alpine tundra. It rises tall against this landscape of tiny plants and looks almost alien-like with its dense clusters of woolly heads and numerous pokey leaves. And unfortunately, because it is a thistle, I have also seen it pulled from the ground by these do-gooders attempting to rid the tundra of this noxious weed. But these thistles are actually really important components of the alpine landscape. And if you're lucky, while you're up there, you may even see a pika running around the tundra 
with bundles of thistle leaves in its mouth. So as botanists, we use multiple lines of evidence to evaluate species delimitations, such as are these distinct evolutionary lineages? Do they exhibit distinct morphology? Do they have distinct non-overlapping geographic ranges? Well, in the case of the mountaintop thistle, the answer was yes to all of these questions, which actually meant that these were not in fact a single species, but at least two, with one hiding in plain sight all these years. So, oh, and this is a picture of us collecting some type specimens of it. So in honor of Vicki and the contribution she has made to the field of study and compositing and so her support for this project and just her support of me in general, I am naming this newly discovered species Circeum funky or the funky thistle. And it is indeed funky. And Vicki's passion for the compositing family fun and generous spirit and amazing mentorship brought so many of us together today. So let us continue forward in our study of compositing with Vicki's spirit of collaboration, inclusivity, and of course, our own innate curiosity about the natural world around us. Thank you. All right. Hey, we can have a couple minutes minutes of questions if anybody want to ask Jen anything. And of course, you can unmute your microphones to to ask questions, or you can just put them on the chat, and we can read it out, read them. And you're always welcome to email me with specific questions as well if you're very curious. So uh, Jennifer, I have a question. Yes, Mauricio. So what are the distinctive features of this funky thistle? Well, the first is the corolla color, which clearly in Circeum scopulorum is uh, this kind of white or purplish color. And then in the funky thistle is yellow. And um, I'm actually going through right now and taking very specific measurements from herbarium specimens to kind of tease out other morphological differences, but just the number of heads in the cluster is a, a, another really good indicator. You see fewer heads in the purple Circeum scopulorum, many heads in Circeum funky. Uh, anyway, I'm teasing the two apart, but the Corolla color just splits it right away. It has been confused for many years as belonging to Circeum scopulorum because of a um, erroneous inclusion of the Corolla color being yellow in the original uh, species description. So that was fun. Thank you. Uh, I think Bruce has a, has a question. Yes, Bruce, hi. Uh, yeah, really it's good to see you. Good to see you. Yeah, um, I was just—I mean, just uh, curious whether uh, Vicky knew you were going to do this before her passing. I just, well, it's too bad. Well, I know. Such a nice thing to do, though. I could think of no better name for this. Oh, yeah, that's great. This whole... Also, I was—I have the same problem in the plants I work in that even native plant people often disparage and pull up tar weeds in California because they think they're non-native or are somehow problematical. But I know it's a lot worse with thistles. Uh, it's a lot easier to do damage to those populations. Has this one seen too much of that kind of activity, do you know? Or? Oh, I can tell you I've seen it numerous times. And if I've seen it numerous times, it's it's happening more more often than, you know, I, I don't go to every mountaintop every summer, right? Um, but part of what I do is I try to talk to a lot of local organizations like the Colorado Mountain Club, the Native Plant Societies, just about the importance of these native thistles in the Alpine. So, you know, got to stand up for them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
Okay, I think we can uh, pass the word to Mauricio. And uh, Mauricio Bonifacino is a professor at the Universidad de La República in Montevideo in Uruguay. Uh, and his work is mainly involving uh, floristics and systematics of the plants of the Southern South America. Uh, and I'm sure he's gonna show us great photos today. He's a really good photographer too. And I hope you enjoy his talk. Well, thank you, Carolina, for the introduction. Uh, I'm Mauricio, I'm from Uruguay, and um, I really appreciate this opportunity of presenting uh, this uh, talk uh, in this meeting. Um, let me share my screen. So, let's see here. Okay, so, um, wait, a, uh, wait a minute, wrong talk. Uh, stop share a second. Something wrong here. Uh, window. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. So, um, First, I would like to mention something about the title uh, that is about TICA and the Global Composite Database, Keeping Wikifine's Legacy Alive. After I sent the title to Carolina, I noticed that it might sound a little bit pretentious. Wikifine's <laughs> uh, Legacy is going to keep alive no matter what we do. What I meant by this title is that uh, uh, kind of presenting in what way, in what sense uh, we as a community could contribute to keep uh, these two uh, undertaken, um, you know, for the most part, uh, you know, pioneered by Vicky, such as the very same Tika and the, you know, the that global composite database alive and further them and help them to, you know, develop even farther. So that's, uh, that's uh, the main idea behind this subtitle of keeping Vicky Fang's legacy alive. So um, I'm gonna uh, present a brief history of Tika and I am glad that uh, we have among the audience, uh, Alfonso, Susana, uh, Bruce Baldwin, Lowell Urbach, um, which are members of the original, uh, or you know, we could say founding uh, members of the Tika among us. So they should be able to correct some of my mistakes and uh, you know, uh, help to tell, you know, a more complete story, perhaps. Uh, then I'm going to give a, you know, brief overview of what the Global Composite Database is about and what status right now is on. And finally, I'm, I'm going to present a, you know, personal perspective of uh, what I think future developments could be in terms of uh, what a TICA community could do. So uh, as you probably most of you already know by now, TICA means the International Compositae Alliance. And this was sort of the brainchild of a, you know, uh, Vicky and Frank, you know, our beloved mentor and who, you know, depart a little soon in my way uh, for events that uh, everybody knows. Uh, I love this photo of Vicky taking care of uh, her garden there and working on some tajiris um, because it shows her in his, uh, her younger years and looking very happy. Uh, but maybe this image kind of give you the wrong idea that she was more of a, you know, not a seasoned field collector. Well, you know, nothing could be farther from the truth. She was a really, you know, <laughs> very hardcore botanist, explorer, uh, never, you know, hesitated in a minute to go no matter where. Uh, here she is uh, in 2009 collecting in the Southern Andes. Uh, so we are at the foothills of uh, Mount Fitzroy, very, you know, interesting place in the Argentinian Patagonia. It was a very hard climb. And uh, she was 66 years old back then. And uh, she got it there no problem at all. And uh, there you have it in Tahiti uh, in 2012. So this kind of show uh, 
that sort of spirit that always, uh, you know, cheerful and uh, exploring and trying to push the frontier of the unknown uh, further ahead. Um, so it's, it's thanks to, you know, his, her vision that we have Tika today. Um, I mean, yeah, she had a lot of collaborators along the way, but he was, it was her, uh, you know, uh, will that keep uh, the thing moving. So uh, just to, you know, get a sense of what uh, this uh, history of uh, the, the International Composite Alliance has been, I prepared a, you know, sort of timeline here to show the, the main events that I am aware of. So Tika uh, started back in 2000 as an informal chain of emails and uh, eventually uh, in the botany meeting of uh, the US in 2000 in Portland, uh, they, they sort of uh, convey on the idea of having a sort of association to get all the people that work uh, on composite, but especially on molecular and trying to get the big picture of the family together by means of um, creating a lease in such a way that they could collaborate among each other to get better results. Uh, so uh, that the name for the uh, for the community back then, the, the proposed name was Deepa Keen, and uh, later after the meeting they uh, added the Composite Alliance. But it was known at the beginning as the Deep Akin. So uh, later on in um, the meeting of Albuquerque, uh, New Mexico, they had the first uh, official uh, meeting of the Tika. Um, and that is, was the site that I was going to be called uh, uh, Deep uh, Akin. In that meeting, uh, they uh, commented about the possibility of uh, having an international meeting. And because uh, some folks show interest in visiting uh, and doing it in South Africa, and because a researcher from there had volunteered to host the event, the next meeting, an international one, which was attended by nearly 50 people, was held in South Africa, in Pretoria, South Africa. This was an important meeting for a series of reasons. Uh, for once, uh, it was uh, the name for, of, of the Deep Akin was changed, and uh, Tika officially was born, the International Composite Alliance. And then uh, other idea that surfaced in that meeting was uh, the need for a, a larger meeting, uh, a sort of standalone meeting, not, not, not one tag to another international uh, botanical meeting. And also, and this is uh, important, uh, uh, to sort of come up with an update of, of what was uh, the Haywood et al. volumes of the biology and chemistry of the composite that were from the late uh, 1970s. So this was the idea. So, um, and I'm glad that one of the uh, organizers of the next meeting is, is here uh, because, uh, so uh, it was decided in Pretoria that this, uh, you know, larger event will happen in Barcelona, Spain. And, but before that, they agreed to have a small meeting, you know, taking advantage of the venue that the International Botanical Congress that was going to, happened in, in Vienna, Austria, it was gonna take an, an year er, earlier than that in 2005. But it was thanks to uh, the, you know, the offer of uh, Alfonso, Susana, and uh, Nuria Garcia Hacas, that, uh, who volunteered to host a, a major meeting uh, in Barcelona, Spain in 2006, that uh, the, the largest event to date pertaining to, to a TICA meeting happened there. Uh, with the help of the Spanish government, uh, who fund, who provided the, the funding, you know, over a hundred people gather in uh, Barcelona, Spain. I have some photos to show um, in a little while about that. And as a result of that, uh, of that meeting, and uh, after almost three years of, you know, very hard work uh, by Vicky and, you know, a group of over 80 authors, Finally, uh, the massive volumes of Funk et al. of 2009 came out. Uh, this was um, really a, you know, a landmark in the history of uh, knowledge of the family. 
because it presented in a very metallic way all the information known by then about the family. Started with an introduction and, you know, the family, uh, you know, morphology, uh, you know, economic uses, and then tribe by tr a treatment for tribe, uh, at the level of tribe for every single tribe know at that time. Uh, it was, uh, you know, highly praised uh, contribution. Uh, and, you know, th there was no such a thing for any other family uh, back then. So it was, it was really a massive, a massive undertaking and uh, Vicky really took the lion's share on the editing of that, of that book, I could say. Um, after the meeting in 2009, um, uh, another meeting of lesser attendance was proposed uh, for Montreal in Canada. This one hosted by Luc Briette. Then uh, another small meeting uh, but was uh, organized by um, Nadia Roque in, in Brazil, in Bahia, Brazil. And uh, eventually another meeting happened in Quito, Ecuador, uh, in conjunction with the Latin America Botanical Congress in 2018. Um, this was to be the last uh, TICA meeting, but all of these meetings besides the Pretoria one and the Barcelona had fewer attendance. So it's, it's hard when you don't get any funding and to get a lot of people together. But luckily these, uh, you know, really uh, pressure to go virtual that this COVID had created, uh, hopefully will create some momentum in us getting together, even if it's not uh, in, a, in a traditional way, at least in a virtual way, like we are doing today. Um, between these meetings, between the Montreal meeting and the Quito meeting, uh, there were other venues organized by TICA, like some morphology courses. There was one in Colombia, there was another in Uruguay. And uh, it's not to say that the TICA as a community, uh, you know, disappear or anything, but, you know, like uh, the activities sort of were more or less reduced. So, um, so that, that's why I like about what's happening right now, which is what I call um, uh, the matrix, the, uh, the, tica, the tica reloaded. <laughs> so these that, um, you know, uh, Isaac, uh, Jennifer, Ackerfield, Jennifer Mandel, Carolina Siniscalci, uh, Shel Cantley, uh, started with the, you know, informal journal club that eventually, you know, transform it into these TICA talks is, uh, you know, totally on the same wavelength of Vicky's idea of putting everybody that is working on the composite together uh, in, a, in a way, in such a way that we all could collaborate and, uh, you know, get to know this wonderful family better. So, um, mm, after this TICA reloaded, I think that we need to start thinking about uh, the next, um, the next uh, presential, uh, you know, traditional uh, meeting. So it's, it is uh, something, you know, hard. We need to get the funding and all that, but it is uh, definitely a lot of you know, more fun to be in person in one place. We could enjoy the full works and get to know more composity and, you know, make uh, more uh, connections with the you know, incredible community of uh, composite researchers. So uh, I really uh, cheer uh, for this opportunity of this TICA Reloaded in the virtual form uh, by this venue. And uh, I'm looking forward to you know, uh, enlarging the community and uh, you know, getting uh, all the people on board. So with that, I'm going to show some photos I got. I apologize for the quality of this one, but this was a photo uh, taken in 2000, in the medium of 2003. There you have uh, Randy Bayer and Vicky Fang on a field trip there in the middle of a sunflower field. So that was uh, one of the largest meetings at the capacity. Um, so this is this, as I said before, this was the meeting where the TICA name became official. And when the decision to update the Hey With It All volume um, uh, came to, to reality, something that will complete it in, in a period of three years. 
uh, considering the, 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 the size of the undertaking, you know, it's a massive book, uh, you know, over a thousand, almost a thousand pages, over 80 authors. Uh, you know, that, that, that was an, an impressive feat, that really, that these, uh, all these guys, uh, you know, pull, pull off. <laughs> And here is a photo that, um, you know, Alfonso, Susana, you know, passed it along of the, uh, of what I call the Tika seismic event because of all the people that assisted there. You know, I counted the people in the, fo in the photo and they were over a hundred. Um, I just want to, you know, point here in the photo, some of the, you know, names that you probably uh, know from the literature. Uh, that attended the, the Congress to show you just an idea of how important the meeting was. Uh, so basically, you know, representatives uh, of, you know, people with long experience in the major tribes were there, people from all continents were there. It was really, really a, a major event. So there you have Alfonso Susana, uh, the lead organizer. Uh, there you have Big Funk. There you have Todd Stussy and there's Randy Bayer. These will be, these four uh, will be the editors of the funk uh, volume. But then you have uh, people like Charles Sheffrey, um, Arne Anderberg, uh, you have Peter Pelser, you have Liliana Katinas, uh, you have Vernon Haywood. Yeah. Um, you have people like uh, Cicela Sancho, Susana Freire, Bruce Baldwin, who is among the audience today. You have Harold Robinson, who you know, you know, also very sadly has uh, recently left us. Also, uh, you have Sterling Keeley, you have Beryl Simpson, um, um, sorry, hold on a second. Try to, okay, there you go. Oh, sorry. So there's, a, there's really, you know, a lot of people that attended that meeting. Um, Alfonso also sent some photos, shared with me some photos of the field trip. This is a more Mediterranean oriented uh, field trip, but I also got to the Pyrenees and there you have, uh, you know, field trip photo of that meeting. Uh, here you have Alfonso and, uh, you know, his wife, Nuria Garcia Hacas, who was also the co-organizer of the uh, Barcelona meeting. Uh, there you have also Vicky. And I just want to mention in this photo, there are a lot of people to mention, uh, but I just want to mention uh, Christina Flan there and Ilse uh, Britwisser, who were, uh, you know, very important figures in the, um, the development of the Composity database, as I will mention in, just in a minute. So, you know, this was really uh, something to behold, this uh, TICA event in Barcelona. And this sort of, uh, uh, you know, meeting is the one I will see in the, in the near future when COVID led us to. So, uh, this uh, meeting is the one that eventually uh, ended up in the production of these massive volumes um, of systematics, evolution, and biogeography of the composite. Uh, so, this is, you know, still. Uh, a reference. Uh, we are over uh, 10 years uh, of uh, where its publication, you know, it's the, the reference for the uh, composite systematics. So uh, going now to the, these other uh, thing in the virtual realm, sort of speak, uh, that Vicky champion, uh, the composite uh, global database. Mm. So this was an idea that started uh, as an idea of Vicky and other collaborators. Um, and it originally started as a global composite checklist. And it started as, as um, you know, a project uh, in which, you know, Vicky Funk, Alan Payton, Il Witzer, Cherry Cooper, Chuck Millen, and Frank Bisbee sort of uh, concocted together the general idea and the, you know, the strategy for sort of uh, farming all the current uh, available databases and putting them together, uh, all the data that uh, pertain to the composite already present in those databases. Um, so, and Christina Flan, 
uh, was the you know the the, tax, the the taxonomic editor for that undertaking. So this was done by, with funding of the Landcare Research in New Zealand, the Wageningen University, uh, Royal Botanic Garden Kews, and Missouri Botanical Garden. And uh, basically, they constructed a, a proprietary database um, in New Zealand to sort of, you know, put together all the information they collected from, you know, a, a lot of uh, databases uh, worldwide. The problem was that after the funding for uh, that project, you know, uh, ended, uh, you know, the database uh, went on a, you know, on a static state, sort of speak. So eventually, uh, Vicky, uh, you know, I don't know the exact circumstances, uh, but she uh, got in touch with the people for, from the uh, Flanders Marine Institute in Ostend, uh, Belgium, where they keep a world register of marine species. So these guys in Belgium had a you know, very strong infrastructure to keep information on biodiversity. And they volunteered to take on um, the, the, this uh, massive database and start, uh, you know, taking care of it and try to improve it. And, you know, they also offer, you know, free hosting and free maintenance, which was it's not small fee considering, you know, the sort of database that we are talking about. So we are fortunate enough that the people in the Flanders Marine Institute, you know, offer that and, you know, of the happy circumstances of Vicky sort of arranged this. So, uh, with all you know the, the 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 massive family that we have you know here illustrated in this most uh, recent uh, classification published uh, by uh, Alfonso et al in 2020 uh, there, there's the need to have this uh, sort of database to you know to have a you know updated you know information on at, at the very basic level of the nomenclature so Currently, there's uh, 168,000 uh, you know, names on the database. So that's a, that, that, that's a lot of names. And the, of those names, uh, currently there's, uh, the current tally is of 32, a little bit over 32,000 uh, uh, accepted species. Of these, uh, you know, 32,000 accepted species, uh, we have uh, only 3% of them checked. That means that that name has been checked by a specialist and is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's correct according to uh, literature. So uh, as you can imagine, this is not something that just a single person could do. This is, uh, this need the, the effort of a lot of people. So that's why important, that's why these sort of uh, undertaking such as the TK important because that's the way we have to reach out to all these people that of course are around the world and this is studying uh, you know all different groups of, of plants because you know it's the individual specialist the one that has worked on a revision for a group of three species ten species or a hundred species the, the one person that knows most about those species and is the person who is in the best condition to curate and edit all these names for for the rest of the community to use, so maybe it is you know a major undertaking for one person or maybe maybe a group of people to you know to take on this assignment and start checking all these names. But if we divide that task among all the researchers in Campositi across the world, so that will be a small effort on on each one side, and that we will sh will be able to you know to curate what will be, you know, the largest plant database, uh, you know, the largest database of a plant family that, that occur on the planet, which I think is, will be quite, quite nice to have that uh, task completed. So uh, the database currently sits at the site composity.org. Um, the site composity.org uh, originally hosted information about the members of the TICA. It was something uh, that was originally created by uh, Thorsten Eriksson, uh, but eventually, uh, you know, Thorsten couldn't, you know, maintain, you know, the update of the site any longer. So he passed the domain to Wiki, and eventually, when the database uh, got hosted at uh, the Marine Flander Institute, uh, we somehow put it nested inside the composite.org site. 
So if you visit the compositive.org site, so you will see some information on Tika and uh, uh, the compositive, and you could go to the, where you have the information on the global database. Get more info there. So here you have a, an introduction that explains what the database is about. So some acknowledgements here you have uh, sort of all the people that was involved in the original, original data collection. And here you have all the original sources, all the different databases that were considered and merged together in this massive database. And right now there's a small list of editors that we hope will increase significantly when we receive the contributions from, you know, all people that is interested in participating in this effort. So any, any citation of the database uh, goes to the Compositive Working Group. And the, everybody that is interested in contributing this is welcome to join the, the Compositive Working Group and form part of this uh, you know, other effort you know, originally thought uh, of by, by BT. So uh, if, if you click here, Access Database, you enter a database. Once you are a contributor, you should be able to log in and start editing stuff. There's ample documentation on how to edit. And I also put available in YouTube a video that shows how to do the basic editing. So it's very easy. Uh, so you could search uh, here for any taxon or you could uh, just go to the taxon tree. You can see how fast my internet connection is. But uh, the taxon tree is, is a nice way to browse through uh, all that you have in the, in the database. So you have here the different subfamilies. There are some subfamilies that need to be added, but the plus um, sign tell you that there's, uh, you know, nested taxa inside. So you could start digging inside and you could, you know, uh, start looking. For instance, I could go to the DC, and I will get inside the, uh, the Barnadisi, uh, Barnadisioidi, I'm sorry, the tri Barnadisi. I go inside the Barnadisi and I get all the genera. I go inside the genera, I get the species. And uh, if I go to any species, I would get um, the information associated with these species, such as you know, the original publication. Well, I have a you know, full classification here and a history of everyone that has you know, made some changes in the editing of this particular, particular name. Uh, so these... Uh, in the database, you'll see that all names have star. If it's a, it's an empty star, it means that the name has not been verified or checked. Whatever it's uh, full in color yellow, it means that it has been verified or checked. Um, so, they, you know, you could add, you know, all different sorts of information to these database, like, you know, the descriptions, the specimens, images. But uh, when we originally started this, we decided that uh, as, as a work of order, we will first deal with the nomenclature to have a clear understanding of what we have, and then we could add on information. But you're welcome to add images uh, or maybe, you know, adding some interesting piece of literature associated to any given species to here. And, you know, in the instruction, it's explaining how to do that. So, uh, it's a very simple uh, interface, as you can see here, and to edit it is also very simple. So I encourage anyone interested to contact uh, me and I will be able to put you in touch with the uh, database administrators who will give you, will grant you access to, to start uh, working as an, as an editor of a particular group. So let me go back to uh, my presentation now. Um, uh, okay, um, so uh, now, um, you know, the, and this is, I'm very excited about this um, because of the relevance that this database has uh, in terms of keeping up to date with, uh, you know, the current, uh, you know, nomenclature and classification of the composite. Uh, you know, now um, this undertaking of the global composite database is part of the world flora offline online. So this is uh, really a worldwide effort to put together all the information on uh, plant families across the world. And they, they, some of the way that the World Flora Online works is that they rely on some taxonomic expert networks who will, to which they, they go to, to uh, you know, confirm 
um, you know, nomenclature or classification. And the Global Compositing Database is the taxonomic expert network for the compositing. So whenever you are participating in the Global Compositing Database, you will be also participating also uh, indirectly into the World Flora Online you will become part of the taxonomic expert network. So I think this is a, this is a really, really interesting thing because it adds value to the fact of editing those uh, names on the database. And again, I want to stress the fact that uh, the reason why it is important that everybody that has uh, you know, produced a taxonomic revision of any group of the composite participates in this is because nobody knows where that group than that person. And it will probably be, you know, very easy for that person to, to check the name because he has all the knowledge and all the information right at hand. Uh, you know, you don't need to go and do a lot of research to do that. You already did uh, the, the research. So that's why important that these collaborations, you know, uh, get sort of funneled through that um, database. So uh, future developments of the uh, global composite database is to finish uh, nomenclature and on the original meeting that we have in 2019 in in Belgium we also decided on the idea that we will sort of publish regular accounts on the number of species uh, that uh, currently are recognized in the family a sort of an update of the number of species checked and uh, how many names were edited and all those sort of things and the you know, authors of that publication will be all the current editors of the uh, you know, database, you know, what we call the Composity Working Group. So I think that that's also something that could offer you know, some retribution for those efforts that people put into completing the database. So once we have that, uh, eventually it will be great if we could add type information, you know, for the same reason that the person that did whatever revision knows, you know, most than anybody about the group of plants, they will also have the information about the type information. And of course, you know, images, descriptions, specimens, you, uh, you know, we could go to, as Vicky will say, to infinity and beyond. We could have all, but uh, we need to try to get focus first on our first and most important task, which is finish the nomenclature part. Once we have that, we will have a backbone of uh, nomenclature and taxonomy for the largest plant family on earth. And that will be just on, on that, a major, a major achievement. Um, so I encourage uh, everybody that is uh, here today, uh, that is not part of the Composite Working Group that, you know, send me an email and let me know what is the group of their specialty. And I will gladly put them in contact with the uh, people that administer the database so you could get access and could start uh, editing in, uh, in the database. So, uh, so if you're interested, you could, you know, drop me an email, as I said, and uh, I, will, I will, you know, promptly do that. Uh, so uh, lastly, what I would like to say, it's a little bit about what I envision as the future of, of TICA and what I would like to see. And um, I can't tell you how happy and excited I am about this sort of uh, Tika Reloaded that started, uh, you know, a year or so ago, uh, thanks to the effort of, you know, as I said, Isaac, Jason, uh, the two Jennifers, Carolina, um, you know, Board and, you know, Morgan and a few others. Uh, I, I think that's not a minor uh, thing. Just the fact of getting together to discuss, uh, you know, journal articles and learning about stuff and knowing what everybody's doing it's uh, a way to get the community together and eventually uh, you know, uh, obtain collaborations and you know, get better at what we do just by means of collaborating. So uh, I think it will be important for Tika to sort of work in the organizational structure. So it, in the way that we know um, who are, uh, you know, what people is in charge of what, so that will keep the thing of not leaving all the work into one person, onto a group of person. And that way we also could divide the work so nobody is overloaded. Um, so that's, I think that's something important that we need to, to work out. Um, it will be nice to have a registration of members. Uh, that was 
Originally, in the in the first uh, website that Thorsten Eriksson created, there was a list of members there. But you know, with the different change of uh, uh, websites, we kind of um, lost that. We have a you know, a, a, it would be nice to have a, a current list of people uh, you know involved with the Tika and who want to be part of their activities. So I think this this event that we are having today of the Tika Talks uh, it is it is uh, you know very very good for promoting uh, all all these sort of uh, collaborations and to get people aware of what other people is doing and the fact that we basically don't have to spend a dollar on, on it makes it very 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 uh -huh. feasible to do it. So uh, I I am really looking forward to the continuation of these Tika Talks. Um, we are going also to start a newsletter. Um, this is not intended to be a continuation of the Compositi um, newsletter uh, that um, Bertil Nordenstam, um, you know, edited for a long time. This is, going, this is not going to be, uh, uh, you know, the equivalent of a, you know, standard venue for publication of research, but more like, uh, you know, like a venue to share whatever you are doing of Compositi that you want the rest of the community to know or something that you really get uh, to want help with. Uh, so it's a sort of, you know, public board uh, where we let everybody knows what everybody in the Compositi uh, community is doing. So it's, it's, a, it's just a standard newsletter. And uh, we eventually will communicate um, what sort of articles we will uh, likely to include, but you know we are open to suggestions uh, for whatever you you are planning to. We originally scheduled uh, to have two uh, issues per year, and the first is going to be in June. So uh, following this uh, meeting, we will send you uh, an idea of what uh, sort of articles and contributions we will like to have, and you are welcome to to contribute to that as well. And uh, we uh, need to start planning a traditional meeting. Um, this was something that while I was uh, talking with Alfonso Susana, uh, he said, well, you should mention that. Yeah, I think it's important that we start planning and having a traditional uh, meeting, uh, start thinking about our life um, post COVID and, and see where we could have that, that, that meeting. And uh, just to, to finish, uh, I would like to say that the the future of Tika lies on collaboration, collaboration, and collaboration. So that's the way we can move forward. Uh, you got a project and you need help from other people either to get a plant specimen, uh, you know, the person who knows better, uh, you know, the, the morphology of a plant, someone that, have, that could, uh, you know, develop some molecular technique that you could have, you know, reach to to learn um, how they are doing whatever methods so you can learn about it. So I think that the, the whole idea of, of, of Tika is trying to get everybody better at what they do by means of learning from whatever uh, all the, the other members are doing. So I think that at least that's, that's, that's the vision I could see Vicky, you know, taking into this uh, this Tika and uh, that's the division I share. So uh, with that, uh, I will finish and I will gladly take your questions. That was great, Mauricio. Thank you so much. And if anybody wants to ask questions directly to him, you can unmute your, your microphones and uh, show up on video, or you can put the questions in the chat and we can read them. And um, as soon as we're done with questions, uh, maybe before the questions, uh, Alfonso wants to make a small announcement. Uh, so I think he, he probably could go before the questions, sorry. Well, it's not exactly an announcement. I just like to, <laughs> hi, Carolina. Well, hello everybody. Just uh, a suggestion. In my experience, the bottleneck for a presidential meeting is as usually money. So before volunteering, please make clear that you can get the funding for between 30 or 50 invitation. I mean, if you want to have uh, a successful meeting, we have to invite um, 
researchers from not so favored countries that cannot afford to go to a meeting. That's what we, we did in Barcelona and we had to do this way again. So please keep in your, in your mind that we need money and we need a lot because uh, I don't know where to do a meeting, but in America or in Europe, it's a lot of traveling. There's a lot of hotels. There's a lot of inscriptions that we have to pay for for people from, by example, from Africa. And so, this is the starting point, the funding. After that, we can discuss who volunteers. Thank you. Thanks, Alfonso. I think that your point in perspective being the lead organizer of the largest TICA meeting should be taken into account, and I appreciate it. If we don't have any questions, can I take a picture? Can everybody put their lunch down? And <laughs> maybe if they want to turn their cameras on, I could take a picture. And if you have an, a sunflower background, even better. Awesome. What I'm going to do, I'm going to take a screenshot. So I'll give you a heads up. I'll say one, two, three, cheese. I'll just wait just another second. If you have a mask, even better, or a dog. There you go. Okay, I think, okay, I'm gonna, one, two, three, cheese. Thank you guys. Mauricio, I have a question. Um, is there any plan to integrate the compos the global composite database uh, to integrate on it data from uh, floristic efforts like the Flora of Brazil? Uh, I think that um, Nadia was uh, Nadia just left um, the the meeting, but she was sort of coordinating that effort, and the idea was to you know uh, build uh, try to use whatever you guys do and try to see how could we could uh, sort of put that sort of dump uh, on, the, on the current database as a way of you know, doing it in a, in a quick way. Awesome. Unless there's any other, any other questions, which I'm sure there are, uh, I just wanted to remind everyone that um, there are some open slots for, for people to share research that they're currently doing or, or have done on Composity in this symposium in upcoming months. Uh, and also that this uh, talk was recorded, so it'll be shared on Twitter via the Tika Talks uh, handle and to share that and let other people know uh, to come, come to future sessions. Thank you, Mauricio. That was an excellent talk. And Jen. Yeah, Mauricio, I just wanted to say, um, for those of you who haven't had a chance to go in and work with the database, it's not just a service to everyone else, but it's a really great opportunity to uh, locate names that you probably haven't encountered before. And I found in going through Meta E and especially Meta E, but a couple other tribes as well, that it was very helpful towards um, improving my understanding of the nomenclature of some of the groups that I've worked on where I thought I had a really good command of the names that were out there. Um, it's uh, such a great compilation of, of names and, and it's super easy to work with. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to try to, I mean, to go through and um, work with the system. It's very forgiving and very well organized. Um, a bit addictive actually. Um, you can definitely get caught in there and and lose track of time. So I uh, definitely strongly endorse it and really appreciate everybody's efforts that went into 
assembling that assembling it. Um, it's an amazing resource. And if you have any oh, monographic <laughs> ambitions in any of these groups that, um, like in my case in the Mede, it's been really helpful for organizing a lot of information and I'll be continually going back to it. It's, um, yeah, so I just wanna definitely give it my two thumbs up. Well, thank you for that comment, Bruce. I really appreciate that. And I appreciate all the, the, the records that you have edited. You know, you rank among the, the, the ones who have edited more records. And so, uh, you know, definitely well, appreciate that. So. <laughs> well, it's, like I say, it's not one-sided. I mean, I've gained a lot from doing what I've done. Okay, I think we're done for today then. And it's been a pleasure to see everybody. Uh, thank you again for showing up. And our next uh, talk is gonna be February 20, 22nd. Uh, so a month from now, more or less. And you can expect an email with the Zoom link uh, a day before the talk as it was this time. And also you're gonna be receiving an email with another link uh, in case you wanna register to give a talk. Uh, in the seminar. Uh, as you, as you've, all, you've all seen, we have a short talk or we can have a couple of short talks and a longer seminar every, every month. So, uh, and the idea of the short talk is to share uh, small results or ideas or uh, new projects. And the, se the, the longer seminar would be to share more uh, um, finished results or papers or uh, whatever you want. Um, this recording will be up on YouTube. Uh, I can show, I can send the link to, and it will be shared on Twitter. And we also have a, a website that it hasn't been uh, really updated yet, but as soon as it is, you will receive a link uh, with the with the website and the updates. Thank, thank you, everybody, and it's great to see you, you guys. <laughs>